Please adhere to YouTube's selected guidelines before viewing content of this video. I do not encourage or condone any products, actions, or behaviors shown in this video. All videos are produced in a safe, professional, and controlled environment. Please do not attempt to replicate any actions performed during the video. All actions are performed by professionals. Alrighty, so today I'm going to be interviewing David Slay, the owner of Hestia Tobacco and Cigarettes. But I do think without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and let Mr. David Slay himself go ahead and introduce well, himself. So, who are you? My name is David Slay. I own uh, Hestia Trading LLC, which is the uh, operating company for Hestia Cigarettes, which after a dozen years has finally launched the first 100% natural American grown cigarette in, uh, I think, a generation. And we're really, really excited about the brand. We've had a tremendous reception so far. We are currently only in Texas and Florida. The regulations of each state need to be added separately. Uh, I basically have to file piece of paper with each attorney general to have an escrow account for the taxes for each and every state. Anyway, so we're, we're building, we're going as fast as we can, and it's, it's a huge adventure, and uh, I'm so excited to be here. So it's great to talk to you. It is great to talk. I, I do fully agree. Um, you, are, you went ahead and just answered a bunch of my questions I already had uh, right there. Uh, what, what, how would you describe yourself, though, per se? Well, <laughs> well uh, I guess that depends on who you ask, but... Uh, Oh, um, uh, I'm tenacious and I don't give up very easily, which is probably why I held on to this idea for a dozen years and why it's actually a reality. I can certainly agree with that. Without um, having the, um, I'm trying to think of the right word, without having the uh, drive to, to get this brand off the ground and to actually get it through the FDA, this would have never happened. And that honestly is something I respect a lot. Thank you so much. Do you think your previous experience working um, with other companies has given you that drive to just keep pushing and everything like that. I saw you used to do um, FX trading on your LinkedIn and stuff like that. And stuff like that, depending on who you ask, can be risky, can be not. And Hestia could be considered to be a risky endeavor. Um, it is. Do you think that has given you some perspective on starting your own uh, tobacco company? Yeah, so there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I am definitely a, a, a gambler by nature, and that served me very well in trading the markets, both uh, currencies and commodities, uh, which I did for a large international grain company. Uh, I really loved it. It, it, um, it was a whole lot of fun, and it led me to Hestia. So um, I was working for them down in Valdosta, Georgia, and met a lot of, uh, I, I was trading actual uh, cash soybeans. We're buying those soybeans, arbitraging the freight. Um, Valdosta, Georgia is was vital to them because the two major rail lines for the East Coast cross there, the CSX and the NS. And good arbitrage rail freight vis-a-vis -vis bean prices and it was, uh, it, was, it was an operation for them. I, I learned so much there, uh, but I also made a lot of friends there and a lot, a lot of those friends, a lot of the farmers physically selling their soybeans to us had been big tobacco farmers who had lost out on dwindling big tobacco acreage. And so they were growing soybeans to, to pay, their, pay their bills. And, but th these guys knew the art of growing and nurturing tobacco and knew it very, very well. And I, I dared them to grow me organic tobacco and said that you know, if they did so, um, I would do whatever I thought I could. Um, using my legal background, I went to law school to practice. Uh, to, to really try to get through and, and bring a, a new, better product to market. And I, I've learned a whole lot from, from then to now, but that initial impetus, uh, I guess that kernel of je ne sais quoi kept the whole project moving forward. Makes sense. Well, that's good to know. That's something I didn't realize. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I, I'm trying to put the right way to put this. My apologies. Um, it's just good to know a little bit about the history of what kind of inspired you to make a Hestia, and I think that's definitely got a, a really good, I think the brand has a really good story behind it. Thank you, um, thank you so much. I, I've always enjoyed, uh, I've always enjoyed tobacco. Um, I started out smoking uh, Cuban cigars with my grandfather, who was an oil driller, and um, used to drill offshore Cuba and go to Cuba a lot. And had a lot of Cuban cigars in his uh, private stash and shared some with me. And that kind of, I guess, nurtured a lifelong love. I've always enjoyed it, I've never really, uh, I really chain smoked, I guess you could say, uh, but I, I do enjoy it quite often, and believe it's got, there's got to be a better way to do it. That uh, cigarettes, as opposed to, I guess, other tobacco forms like Cuban cigars, Dominican cigars, Nicaraguan cigars, 
uh, really became kind of bastardized with a lot of additives and chemicals, and um, I wanted to return that to making a pure, better, um, beautiful product uh, that used the, the knowledge and foresight that my farmers brought for generations of, uh, of learning about their land. So, so that, that has been the nexus of the Hestia journey. So when you say that Hestia is how cigarettes were before all of the additives and everything like that? Well, it certainly doesn't have any additives, and I'm not old enough to, to know. Uh, I wasn't smoking back in the 1930s, but I would imagine so. Makes sense. Uh, and I think uh, one of the questions you mentioned, you started smoking uh, with your father and grandfather? Grandfather. Grandfather. Uh, when did you start smoking, though? Just to give everybody a little bit of perspective. When I was 21 years old. Of course, of course. Makes sense. Well, I'm not going to ask any further than that. Uh, I think the last question I have, uh, just generally about you, is, well, what's your favorite color? Um, Eve's Klein Blue, YKB. It is a bright effervescent royal blue that my wife introduced me to um, many years ago, and I absolutely love it. That's a much more specific answer than I would have had. I ain't gonna well, lie. What, what would you have said, Jacob? I think I'd probably say I know black isn't technically a color, but yeah, so yeah. All right. I wear black all the time. I really like black, and uh, all right. I wouldn't put it on a wall, but I well, I've never seen you and Batman in the same room, so the jury's still out. Makes sense. Uh, but I think I, I do indeed, of course, have some questions about Hestia itself. Um, so I think we already covered, uh, like, what made you want to create Hestia. You wanted to make a natural cigarette brand um, that doesn't have, added, that the cigarettes don't have additives in them, uh, to kind of admire uh, what the tobacco farmers do and, and the effort they put in. Uh, but what was the inspiration for the name? Hestia. I know you've told me this previously, but uh, I figured it might be worth saying. Absolutely. Uh, you basically just said why, in that it's about profiling the farmers and the art of pure and good agriculture. Um, Hestia is the Greek goddess of the communal fire. Vulcan is the god of fire. Hestia is the goddess of the communal fire. And uh, when they would go, when, when, they would, when, when they would conquer a new city or build a new city, they would take poles. From you know, they had to have the fire burning all the time. It's that, that's how they that's their power. That was their lifeblood. And they would take those coals, and a priest or whatever would walk those coals to the new city to keep them going. And those are the coals. Those are the fires of Hestia. They were, they were communal, and you couldn't live without them. And uh, as I was, I guess, iterating on the ideas of smoking and whatnot uh, a dozen or so years ago, the uh, recurring theme, I guess, was the communal fire. That you know, I I don't always, I don't often smoke completely alone, uh, even if I'm alone, I'll call a friend up, uh, pour whiskey or coffee, but it, there's something about that communal aspect to enjoying tobacco that I've always resonated with and enjoyed, and I wanted to bring that uh, that vision into fruition. Makes sense. I can definitely agree with that, and like, I personally enjoy smoking cigarettes by myself, but honestly... You're not by yourself, you're with all well, these is, people! This is fair. This Hundreds of thousands point. of them around the world! This is a good point. But when I'm smoking cigarettes off video, they're very enjoyable to smoke alone, but when you're smoking them with other people, whether it be on video or whether it be with you or, or with uh, friends and stuff like that, it really does um, hit different, I do suppose, is the best way I can describe it. So uh, definitely makes sense, and I, I really do like the name SD. I think it's got a lot of money behind it. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much. So uh, just going right into the like sort of super deep uh, company questions, uh, what is Hestia's target demographic? I'm not going to mention any brands or anything like that unless you want to. Um, uh, but, what other uh, brands? We're the, we're the only brand there is, Jacob. Exactly, exactly. Uh, our target demographic is people who um, are, how to put it, um, people who understand that everything they do in life has certain elements of risk. Um, so when I think about Hestia, I think about our target demographic, I think about folks who enjoy going out with their friends on Friday, Saturday night, and sitting outside under the stars and enjoying a few cigarettes with their with their beers or whiskey, and um, that is that's who I'm targeting. Um, folks who want to know that their product is one that's been made with care and love, and is representative of perhaps the, uh, the same way that they hope to live their own lives. Understandable. I do uh, I do appreciate the answer. Uh, definitely. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a word judge over that. Okay, I'm going to go and move on to the next question. So I completely lost what I was thinking about. Um, so, 
so how do you market a tobacco company these days with all of the regulation in place? I know that's been one of the largest challenges for Hestia. How can you grow a, a company uh, with all of the regulation on marketing and everything like that these days in, in the sphere of the tobacco world? Uh, very carefully, but again, when you have when you start from a vantage point of making a better, purer product, um, and that's your mission. The marketing itself is almost secondary. It, it comes naturally because people want to whatever the product is, whether it's a um, you know whether it's a, a dry aged steak or a really good handcrafted bourbon or a cigarette or really anything else. If you have, if you start from a place of care and concern and um, vitality, I think that the market itself, the marketing happens for you by people believing in your product. So, surely as a cigarette company, there isn't a whole lot we can do. Obviously, we can't sponsor billboards, we can't put up billboards, can't, you know, sponsor uh, athletic events, things of that nature. Um, that's been in place for a very, very long time. But, what we can do is sell the best damn cigarettes in the market and make sure, and people realize that. Um, and, and that goes a long way. So word of mouth is uh, what I'm doing. That's exactly what it is, my friend. Makes sense. I think the next question I have uh, is just, uh, what's the biggest hurdle uh, you've had um, when starting Nesky? I know it took 12 years to get through the FDA, of course, that's a huge hurdle, but uh, finding investors, I imagine, for tobacco company is also something that is more challenging than not. Um, and of course, just the regulation of even getting started um, is, of course, just insane. Uh, what would you say is the biggest hurdle? Well, the biggest hurdle is just really knowing what, what the hurdle was. I mean, you know, you say, I'm sorry, a cigarette company. Well, that, that's a nice, concise way to say about 185 different little bitty things that need to be done and not having a roadmap. So, you know, being the only one to have done this in a very, very long time. There was not a roadmap. I mean, you know, I guess in a comparison to say a microbrewer uh, for beer, whiskey, things like that, there have been enough of those that there is a roadmap of how you do that and the regulatory procedure that you step through, the hoops you jump through to accomplish your goals. And if not, you could probably call up another microbrewer or whatnot, micro distillery, and try to get some answers. Uh, I that did not exist. It does not exist for Hestia. I'm not answering calls from anybody trying to find out how either. I got, I got a corner of this market. Um, but so, so it, it was really a lack of lack of clarity. Um, no one really has had any idea. In fact, um, just this morning, in fact, just right before we sat down for this interview, I was dealing with an issue that arose because, as, as I mentioned previously, we're licensed in Texas and Florida. Uh, Florida. I, I called and spoken with uh, half a dozen different folks in their auditing tax department and they had me fill out all these forms, pay these licenses, I even had to submit fingerprints. And they said everything was good to go. And uh, it, 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 to my knowledge it was, uh, we just fulfilled a, a very significant order to a major distributor in South Florida last week, uh, which we're really excited about. And the uh, head of, the, of our contract manufacturing company uh, which is, uh, we're manufactured uh, by a wonderful Native American tribe in upstate New York, the Seneca Nation. Uh, they're a Seneca manufacturing company there. They're owned by members of the Seneca Nation. And uh, John called me up and said, I don't think we're lightly, like, our factory isn't licensed to sell in Florida. And I said, well, that's fine because I am actually licensed as the manufacturer. And I called all the paperwork and here's actually the link to the website on the Florida Department of Professional Regulations that shows Hestia Trading LLC and a list next to, you know, Philip Morris, RJ Reynolds. Like, we, we are one of those there. And so they go, okay, let me double check here. And he, he dug in and then we got the guy from Florida on the phone. And he's like, oh, well, um, let me look into this. I, I, you know, I think you're right. We got to have another, another form filled out. And so it's just, it's that kind of lack of, and again, there's no malicious intent or anything. It's just that nobody has done this. And so even on a regulatory level, very, very few even understand what needs to be done. And I'm really thankful and grateful for the grace that a lot of these regulators have shown me because we're all trying to kind of figure this out together because there isn't anyone else doing this. And I'm, yeah, so that's, that, I think that's kind of the most I guess, interesting thing about in that Makes novel sense. aspect. And especially with uh, the, the whole, with the people who might have known 
how to start a, uh, or not how to start a or how to um, get the regulations set up. Everybody who worked for the government and the distributors and everything like that, a lot of them probably don't work for these distributors anymore. It's been so long since new companies have come, come into the market, so this is probably a completely new experience for people, which is something that, honestly, I, I had never really considered until you mentioned it right before uh, we started filming the interview uh, that we're filming right now. It's just something I had never even considered, and it really uh, did bring a, a lot of... Um, it really did um, bring a lot of uh, light to the situation. I think, in fact. Uh, moving on to the next question, which I completely forgotten what it was. Uh, I was, uh, I think, I was going to go ahead and ask: uh, Are there any plans to expand Hestia as a brand overseas or anything like that? Uh, absolutely. Um, world domination is my goal. Uh, but no, I, I was on the phone. Um, with a distributor, a very large distributor in Australia last week who uh, requested some samples to begin the process of registering Hestia in Australia, uh, which is a you know, whole other thing, but it's not a goal, it's, it's not a near-term goal of mine at all, and the journey of Hestia was one that went down a road of international uh, distribution that, that failed fabulously and fantastically and blew up my face and cost me a lot of time in that uh, in that linear progression, as it were. But uh, it certainly, I mean, it, it is certainly a, a goal, and I would certainly like to. Um, I don't, my efforts are focused primarily and strictly at this juncture on growing Hestia domestically and getting the next 48 states registered, which I'm hoping uh, in 2023 to accomplish. And I believe I, I can with good work. I mean, that uh, comes out to about one a week. So it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be a, going to be a, a hard fight, but. I hope by this time next year I can say that we have blanketed the U.S., and I think we can. And if other distributors want to take the initiative of registering SDI, I will certainly lend my uh, legal support and anything I can to help them do so. But I personally just don't have the uh, bandwidth to work on that uh, in the near term. Makes sense, fully understandable. One question kind of along those lines, and I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, uh, with some, I know some countries uh, don't really allow the import export of tobacco from other countries. So if you were to, uh, if you were to sell Hestia in, I know you used Australia as an example, would you have to grow the tobacco there or could you directly import the cigarettes? So I know that Brazil is one of those countries like you mentioned. Um, you have to grow a certain amount of the tobacco it has to be domestically grown for uh, Brazil. I don't know what the, I, I really do not know the legal ramifications or, or framework uh, for Australia, so I don't. Uh, so if that were to happen, uh, I don't think SD would grow there. It would, would actually grow, like we wouldn't grow the brand there because I don't really have any interest in working with uh, farmers in other countries. I, I'm really proud of the work we do here. Uh, part of the uh, beauty of the brand is that we are all American-grown farmers, um, American-grown tobacco, American -grown tobacco by American farmers, and that is, I think, part of our identity. I want that to be part of our identity, part of our brand, and I wouldn't want to dilute it by bringing on other tobaccos. Fully understandable. It's all about brand image, and uh, that's what we've got to keep coming. Uh, I think my next question is that uh, I heard. Um, I want to say Reddit, uh, that you mentioned that there are possible plans to release a menthol variety of Hestia in the future. Uh, with the um, menthol ban possibly booming in the next 10 years or so, what are your thoughts on both the menthol ban and what are your thoughts on releasing a uh, menthol variety with the menthol ban possibly booming? Well, my thoughts on the ban is that it's a little bit silly. Um, that you know, people who want to enjoy menthol cigarettes should be able to enjoy a menthol cigarette. Um, and that uh, in a country where you're allowed to have personal freedom, it seems a little ironic that they would be going after uh, people's choice and choosing to smoke a menthol cigarette. That's, that's all I really say about that. Uh, we, we do have a menthol approved. Um, it is, it's in the works. Um, I, I'm hoping to release it this summer, but it's, I, I really got to nail a few aspects of tweak it and get it right. Um, obviously, with menthol, there 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 are a lot of other variety. Uh, what's what I'm looking for? Uh, 
attributes? Well, no, no. There's just other characteristics that I need to that I need to get nailed to, to really make it right and do it uh, and make it true to the brand. And I am not there yet, uh, but we're very, very close. And I'm looking forward to doing it. And uh, we'll have to we'll have to enjoy a few when they roll off the line. I do agree with that. I'm certainly looking forward to giving them a review whenever they uh, come out. That is for sure. I, I, I'm sure, uh, based off of what I thought of these, I'm sure I will uh, enjoy the Michael variety you know, just as much, if not more. I, I wouldn't uh, make them if you didn't. Man. Sorry. I wouldn't make them if you didn't. Uh, I understand. Um, so I think my next question. Um, so what it was just based on uh, how many varieties do you add realistically? So you've got the two varieties out now, the Hess Perform and the Stone Forms, with plans to make a menthol variety. Uh, do you have any plans to make even more varieties in the future? I know you said you were only approved for uh, the three brands, or not three brands, the, the three varieties. Um, so, but, but if you want to do expand the brand even more, could you see yourself realistically adding any more varieties that you're supposed to be yeah, Jacob, I'd love to. Um, considering how long it took to get this, I don't know how feasible that is. Um, the community, the cigarette subreddit, uh, has, I've received a lot of requests for doing, obviously that's a cigarette tobacco enthusiast community, and a lot of those enthusiasts are very, you know, they go, they take things, they're very, they're very proud of what they do, and um, they're very sophisticated in their enjoyment, and I've received many, many requests for releasing a uh, unfiltered, for instance. Sounds great. Um, it sounds like another 10 years of melees with the FDA. So there comes a point that perhaps as this gains momentum and steam, the processes for getting those things registered becomes a little more streamlined. And if that's the case, uh, and I can take my same tobacco and just wrap it without a filter at the end, then I would gladly do so. And it'd be a lot of fun and diversify the brand. And I. I enjoy it. I very much enjoy unfiltered cigarettes. Um, so I, I would be very much in favor of that, but not knowing what those regulatory, if those regulatory hurdles would ease, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to sit around for 12 years and wait. Makes sense. And I think um, one other question I kind of have along the lines of um, the sort of like ease of getting through the FDA, which of course was not an easy process. Uh, do you think the fact that you got through the FDA at all is because you're a small tobacco company, because you're not big tobacco, or do you think they have a, a, an advantage over you or anything like that? Um, does big tobacco have an advantage over me? Well, yeah. I do suppose the answer is already pretty clear. Well, it's nice to have 60% of the market. It that is. would be really nice. I, I, I wish I did. And I'm going to keep fighting. Um, let, me, let me get to 1% first. Understandable. Uh, so, yeah, of course I have an advantage. Um, but, you know, that's, uh, it's nice, you know, monopolies are nice. So, uh, I think it was Peter Thiel who uh, said that, you know, going from zero to one, um, monopolies are the, best, are the most efficient way to grow. So, I agree. It'd be nice. He is certainly not wrong, that is for sure. I think uh, the, Final question I have in this sort of segment is just where do you see Estia in ten years? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, okay. So you know we're we're about ten years down, ten years to go. Um, I certainly would like to grab one percent of the U.S. market. Uh, put in context, um, there, there's another uh, nationally uh, sold, all natural or fairly, you know, additive free, I should say, cigarette company that has about three and a half percent market share. So I'd like to get to 1%. That'd be a goal for the next decade. Um, but really, really, uh, that, that's a sales goal. That's nice. Um, and that just happens by word of mouth. People join the brand. Um, I hope that I can enable more farmers to grow uh, better, more beautiful plants, and that I can use those plants to uh, make some really tasty product. And so as long as I can keep you know, enabling them to grow more acres, and uh, making more beautiful plants, then uh, I think that my goal is is satisfied. Makes sense. Well, really understandable. Just basically just keep doing what we do. I hope so, man. Makes sense. I can uh, definitely relate to that, that is for sure. Uh, so I think just some questions about the tobacco industry as a whole. Uh, or I also now I now have some questions about just the tobacco industry as a whole. Sure. Uh, do you think uh, there will be more tobacco, small tobacco companies appearing in the future? Uh, now that you've proved that it's possible, I know you might not want other competition. Okay, uh, not. But do you, 
totally understandable. But do you think it's a possibility? Don't do it. It'll take you 12 years and possibly bankrupt you and ruin everything. Do not do it under any circumstances. Run and hide. Run and hide. Understandable. I'll find you. Totally understandable. Um, uh, no, but um, to be perfectly frank, uh, it probably helped my farmers. I, you know, I, I started this vision because I wanted to help my farmers, and I and I believe in what they do. And if there's another brand that comes along, you know, if I if I if I get sloppy and I lose my vision, and another brand can come along and do what I'm trying to do better, then do it. You know, uh, I, I'm here to enable my farmers to do the best that they can do. And if I get too big for my britches and need to be cut down to size again, then I hope that there's someone that comes along and challenges me in that because that, that'll make that'll make a better product and make us all better. So I think competition is actually you know the grist of success. And um, if I falter, I welcome that. Makes sense. Fully understandable. And it's definitely one of those things that I can relate to with, with YouTube watching other people's videos and I'm like, okay, here's an aspect that I really like. How can I improve to compete better? Competition really is the grist of, uh, is really, really is the uh, epitome of, of YouTube, the tobacco industry, and just capitalism as a whole. Um, so it's fully understandable why you, you feel that way as well. Um, and so I think my next question is just uh, what the FDA approval process looks like for cigarettes in specific. I know for cigars that there's really not an FDA approval process, or at least there wasn't. I'm not so sure on how that uh, works. For, for filter little cigars, there is now, uh, which is what Hestia originally, uh, we used our tobacco for that process originally. Um, for, for hand rolled and fine tobacco, uh, I don't think so yet. And the reason is because they make so many different varietals with, you know, they just, it's the leaf from the use. It, 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 would, it would bog down the FDA, and frankly, um, those who are smoking, you know, $30, $40 cigars are probably not folks that are that the FDA is really too concerned about. I could be wrong. Um, I'm sure the FDA would like to find a way to regulate everything. Um, they get more user fees. Uh, it, it, it's, government is also business in, in a certain sense, but no. Um, from regulatory side, cigarettes, uh, you have to uh, either submit a substantial equivalence, um, basically saying your, that your product is substantially equivalent to a product that's no more harmful than anything else in the market, and have testing data to back that up, and have uh, very capable uh, lawyers to, to plead your case. And that is, I guess, the, the clear, without getting bogged down in specifics and sort of nonsense that, that none of your viewers are probably going to really care about. Uh, that is kind of the clearest way. Is the FDA is very, um, from a straight, if the process was straightforward as it appears on their website, all you must do is show that you have a product that is no better or worse, no worse than anything else in the market. And if that's the case, and you can prove that and have all the evidentiary tests to back you up, then they will approve you if they ever get around to submitting your application. Makes sense. And that uh, it, the the impression I get is the problem is that they. Uh, might They're understaffed like also. I mean, you know, uh, there was a piece on my company back in, gosh, in 2013 or 2014 that the FDA had been you know, looking at applications at that time for like three or four years and had yet to really even get to one. Mm. So, you know, um, and, and it was a new department that was created uh, and they were understaffed. And so, you know, as much as I want to complain about elements of that, if you're understaffed and you can't do what you're supposed to, if you don't have the people to do what you're supposed to do, then while it may be really frustrating for me and for other folks who want to enjoy certain products, you don't have the manpower to physically go out there and do what you're mandated to do. And so that's another problem. Understandable. And that's something, honestly, that I hadn't taken into consideration as long as there. It's the government, I figure, they're probably not understaffed, it's federal employees, and Yet, that is an issue, and that's something I hadn't considered. So, thank you for shedding light on that. I do appreciate it. I, I think the next question I have is just how source, how does sourcing tobacco work? Uh, my family uh, used to grow tobacco here in North Carolina. Uh, it's part of it all. Uh, exactly. Uh, that's what my grandfather did uh, for years and years and years until he passed. And he eventually got out of the industry before he ended up retiring, uh, simply due to it being kind of too much of a regulatory castle at that point. Um, and, but, but from what I heard, a lot of the ways that he would sell tobacco was just selling tobacco in bulk at auctions. Is that how you get your tobacco? The auctions don't really, uh, the auctions aren't really uh, as much of a thing anymore because the volume is lower. 
but um, until recently, really, um, I wasn't even really allowed. Like I, I would purchase it from. I would have the farms that I that I knew of, and they would sell to brokers essentially, because the whole different licensing process. And then the brokers would sell it to me, and then I would send it to a processor, turn it into, so you take the leaf, obviously after it's cured, and you turn it into what they call a strip, which is where it's sort of, it's made in the long strips. And then the strip is then cut into rag, which is what we're smoking right now. It's a, and then from there it goes to my factory, it's made for cigarettes. But I would buy the, the leaf from the broker, who then sends it to, the um, primary, uh, stemmary, it was de-stem and turned into strip, so cut the you know, thing of the stems and the leaves, and kind of, you know, rolled, and then from there it goes, but that, that's kind of where I enter the process. So I identify, and I, you know, I know these farmers, and I have for a while, but physically, I, I'm not actually, you know, paying them directly because of, because of regulatory reasons, and so that's kind of the, it's, it's a more of a, a second-hand kind of approach, and I have to, you know, and brokers make money on that process as well. Well, that makes that that was honestly one of the things I was thinking might be concerned with um, with getting product on the market at a consistent price. If you've got to constantly buy at auctions, right? Um, then you're going to constantly have a fluctuating price. Um, so that well, that's you know, I mean that, that's something that we're that we're looking at. Obviously, uh, you're, I'm sure you're familiar because of your family's history with tobacco. Uh, we go to plant usually in um, Feb late February, early March, uh, put it in the, uh, the greenhouses. And I'm hoping to, if I can, if I have enough volume and enough uh, saturation, I'll be able this year for the first time, contract at that stage. And at that stage I'll be able to, I'll need to guarantee more volume but I have a better idea of that. But then hopefully keep my pricing a little more constant moving forward. So that's, that's, a, that's a real goal and that's a good question. Understandable. Well, I do appreciate that. And it seems like I know the whole brokerage process from your perspective is probably not very streamlined, but for me it just seems like a much more streamlined. Oh, it's much easier for the farmers. Much easier absolutely. for the farmers. Okay. Good to know. I was thinking it was probably going to be slightly more of a hassle, but if it's not and it makes it easier, then I can't complain about that. Uh, I think my next question is just uh, well, I know Pesky is uh, just run by you, but realistically, how many people does it take to run a tobacco company? Uh, one insane person, or uh, I don't know, probably a dozen, a dozen sane people. Um, I am very uh, blessed, thankful that I do have a legal background. So even though I do work with a excellent law firm, um, I am able to, I guess, sort of do the primary sorting and filtering of the issues to kind of direct and know what needs to be presented and looked at with my attorneys, and then moving on. So you gotta, I mean, you gotta have. Uh, a liaison to the farms, you got to have a liaison to legal, you got to have a liaison to manufacturing. Uh, obviously, legal will also function as a liaison to government and regulatory. And uh, at some point in there, you got to sleep as well. But um, I don't know how to exactly answer that. You, If you wanted to do it, um, you'd probably need a team of a dozen, I would think, at least. It makes sense. And I uh, think one question, I know you mentioned that you have a, a, a law, firm, law firm you work with. Was it difficult to find a law firm that would be willing to take on a tobacco-related lawsuits? Is that something that a lot of law firms are not willing to touch, or do they not really care? Money's money. Well, thankfully, there's no lawsuits, uh, and, and I hope and pray there never are. Uh, we've, we've abided by all the, all the laws that, uh, that are there. Um, but no, there are, there are some excellent firms that, that do specialize in representing um, folks with tobacco interests. Um, they, they all have offices in Richmond, Virginia. Of course. And uh, that's, that's how that works. Makes sense. Well, good to know. That's uh, something I was uh, just thinking, and I'm glad you had an answer. Thank you very much. Uh, so, I think my next question is just what are some marketing restrictions that folks like I, who do not work in the industry, might not know about, but you having first hand experience do know about? Of course, we mentioned you mentioned previously you can't put stuff on billboards, but what is something that might be a little bit more, I guess, uh, under the under the water that we might? Let me think here. Um, well, so I have to. So social media is obviously a, a new form since a lot of the regulation passed for tobacco companies. I know the FDA is trying to sort their way through this with uh, other tobacco products that might not be so igneous, shall we say. 
but I have to file a form with the FDA to tell them about all my social media accounts, and they can check up, and uh, I imagine if I were to step out of line, they, I, I would get a letter saying I needed to, to revise or you know, delete something. But, you know, while well, well, I'm very happy to have an active social media presence, that that is something that is being actively, actively looked at. And so I have to, you know, um, be very uh, mindful of that. And, uh, and, and that's fine, again, you know. The last thing I want is anyone underage enjoying us too. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that, that, that's just something that I have to keep from front of mind as I go about my day of marketing the product. Makes sense. Well, I think that's probably just about the best answer I could have thought of. That's something that, honestly, I, I when, when I, I, I've, I've just thought about theoretically, like, okay, what would it look like to start, what, what, what would it look like to start my own cigarette company before I ever spoke with you? And looking at social media and, and seeing what has happened to uh, other companies that I'm not going to name, I was like, this is something that I, I wouldn't even touch because I figured that the FDA was just off the strip, just no-go kind of thing. But now finding out that you can do that without needing to worry about it, that you just need to... You just have to report. You just have to report. Uh, that honestly is something that was completely new to me before I had spoken to you, so it's something that's really good to know. Happy to help. Um, I do appreciate it. I do appreciate it. Um, and I think I have one other question that I thought of, and I completely forgot. No, it was sort of that. I just thought of off the top of my head. Uh, but I think um, the next question I have actually was the question that I had off the top of my head. Um, so, Hestia, currently speaking at least, mainly ships uh, their cigarettes uh, through a company. Um, so how does this work regulation-wise, and how hard is it to find somebody that is willing to ship cigarettes? So that, that, that was difficult. So from a regulatory standpoint, you cannot ship, it's illegal to ship cigarettes through the post office uh, for, you know, at, beyond just like sending out commercial samples for testing, uh, people that were, you know, sending them to a distributor to basically check and see if they want to bring them on board, something like that. Outside of that very specific realm, uh, you cannot ship to the postal service. And uh, there's, I think it's called the Jenkins Act is, is the law that prohibits that. But the other major shippers, so you think of your DHL, UPS, FedEx, uh, just will not because they don't want to get, they, they don't want to get fined and they, they don't want to deal with that. But uh, during the pandemic, uh, a small, I guess a constellation of smaller shippers around the country rose up that would, you know, verify age and make sure that the product was going to where it's supposed to go to and that the person that they were delivering to was of age. And um, then there's a company that basically brings all those together and will ship. It's very, very expensive. But so there's nothing specifically illegal about shipping cigarettes. If you have, you know, I have to have the correct stamp for each state. I need to make sure all that I can also have a retail license and that all the taxes, um, sometimes on county, city level, all are paid. As long as all the taxes are paid um, and you have a shipping company, there's nothing illegal about doing it. It's just that it's very expensive and that's why we only ship cartons because I actually absorb a lot of the, the margin that I would otherwise pay, I guess you'd say, as a distributor or retailer, I am absorbing and eating. Uh, off of the, uh, the shipping cost, um, so it's uh, it's, a, it's an expensive process, but it's a way to get our brand out there. We've had a really good reception on it, and I'm happy we can do it. Um, I know I get probably lots and lots of emails every day uh, from customers or wannabe customers wanting to not buy a whole carton and wondering where they can actually just buy a pack. Uh, I can't ship a pack. I mean, I could, but it would be you know 25 bucks plus the cost of you know no one wants to pay 35, 40 bucks for a pack of cigarettes. And so they uh, that's why we have cartons, and that's why we're building out our distribution network to make sure that there's retailers uh, in all of our state right now, just Texas and Florida, where they are supplied everywhere. So like I said, we have comprehensive distribution now for Southern Florida. Uh, working on the northern part of that state, we have retailers in um, Austin, Texas, and San Antonio, and working on a distribution deal for blank in the state of Texas, and uh, that will make sure that folks can actually go out to their preferred tobacconists to pick up a pack or two of uh, Hesties. Makes sense. It's uh, definitely a lot more complex than I was thinking um, when I was first asking you this, uh, a very similar question when you were speaking a couple weeks ago. 
uh, definitely a lot more complex, and it's something I, I didn't expect to be as much of a hassle as it is. That it is for sure. Uh, and it's also yeah. one of those things. They also don't tell you how much you're going to burn your fingers trying to put the tag stamps on. So oh. you know, because you have to put them right on the cellophane, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. They, they just burn right in. Yep. It's, uh, you, oftentimes they'll burn your thumbs, burn your, burn your index fingers, and it's just uh, part of the fun. Not fun. Not fun. <laughs> That's a, it doesn't sound like fun to me, but uh, you know, they don't tell you that if you want to start your own cigarette company that you're going to burn your fingers off trying to put tax stamps on. So good to know. Well, um, just trying to think of what I, I had some, oh, I did have something else I wanted to say. I know if. Um, you made you used to make the little folks with scars, mm-hmm. as yeah. previously mentioned. Was shipping those the same process, or was that a different no, process? No, those those, those aren't those at the time were not taxed on a on a uh, you didn't put a tax stamp on them, so uh, there, it was a totally different regulatory framework. They weren't illegal to ship by via USPS, um, so it was it was a whole lot easier. A lot easier at the time. I, I believe I, I'm not directly transparent on it, I'm not up to date with the, with the regulatory framework that they're under now. I know it's changed significantly, but I don't know the exact uh, uh, issues regarding that in the moment. But at the time, in you know, 2012, 2013, when we were shipping those, it was a different regulatory framework. We could ship via USPS around the country. Good to know. I guess the, it's all about the, percep- the general perception and everything like that makes sense. I think the next question I have is, uh, and, and let me know if you're not willing to answer, this is uh, on here, uh, it's no issues at all if you're not willing to answer, it's just about um, how small tobacco companies can protect themselves against possible legal litigation or anything like that. If you don't want to answer that? No, I'll happily no answer that, no. Um, look, legal litigation comes up from breaking the law or per- 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 perceived breaking the law or doing something wrong. Um, whether you're a small tobacco company or a big tobacco company or, or, or anything, if you follow the law and you know play it straight, then someone might get upset and try to you know file a lawsuit, I guess. But if if you are covered because you follow the law, that that is that is your defense. So I, I don't think I, I don't anticipate Hestia having any legal troubles because we don't we don't do anything to have them trouble. Understandable. It, it, it took us 12 years. We played it straight, and we're really proud of what we've done. And I would not ever want to do anything that would jeopardize my farmer's ability to be able to bring a really great product out there. Totally understandable. Well, it makes sense. And most of the legal litigation I've seen brought against the other tobacco companies um, in, the, in the past are very much kind of it very much in a gray area of the law and everything like that. And Hestia. Uh, from, from an outsider's point of view, is very much following every single law to a T, and that's definitely something I respect a lot, uh, especially when compared to a lot of other cigarette companies who are very much, as I said, riding that gray here. Thank you, Jacob. Again, you know, we're, we're really proud to be here and really thankful to be here, and we're, we're not interested in, in really playing any games in that regard. Makes sense. We, we have plenty of folks who absolutely love the product and are excited about it without having to bother with any kind of gray area. Exactly. Why, why have to take too many unnecessary risks? Why take any at all? Exactly. And I think the um, next one I had um, was just, and once again, let me know if you're not willing to uh, answer it, uh, just how easy or hard is it for somebody to start legal litigation against a uh, tobacco company or, or anything like that? Well, I don't have any uh, experience with that. Uh, I guess my... my legal training would inform that. I mean, anybody can file a lawsuit against anybody for anything. Um, but, thankfully, I, I, you know, you, anyone can file a lawsuit for anything. But I, I, I'm not, again, I'm not worried about that because you have to have a standing to sue. You have to have a reason to file a lawsuit. There has to be some kind of mal- malfeasance. There has to be a, a tort or some kind of breaking of the law or regulation. And because we don't do that, I can't imagine that that would be an issue. Makes sense. Can't stop anyone from trying to file a lawsuit, but it's not you know, if, you, if you don't break the law, you're not. You know, uh, truth is the best defense. Exactly. exactly. I do fully agree with that. And um, I know I've seen articles that didn't really list their um, sources particularly well. Previously, say that uh, a lot of tobacco companies have to join joint lawsuits. 
with other tobacco companies when one tobacco company is in a lawsuit or something like that? Is that something that you would have to do as the owner of a tobacco company, or is that something that you don't even have to worry about? Well, I, so the only example that I think of, that I can think of that you're referencing is currently there is uh, ongoing. I don't know if litigation is even the right word, but the FDA has proposed, as I'm sure you're aware, the um, photo uh, warning labels, and they are a violation of free speech. This is my marketing right here. If I can't have this, then you know this is this is my product. And uh, some of the some of my some of my larger competitors have filed uh, injunctions against the FDA to prohibit that. Um, I guess if they were to ask me to join, I would. Uh, ask my attorneys to file an amicus brief that means like a friend of the court like saying you know we agree we concur with this opinion but i don't there's not an imperative to do so as far as uh i've i've been led to understand good to know well i do appreciate that that's something i was very not clear on so i'm glad you were able to clear that up for me i don't think i would be forced to to join that but it would you know perhaps be to my benefit because i don't want photo uh warning labels and i don't think they're they're constitutional i, I believe that very very firmly and I'd be happy to, you know, to make my case regarding that. Especially for a new brand, you know, there are legacy brands that are very well established that would be very, uh, perhaps unaffected by, because people, the names are so well understood and recognized that it wouldn't be an issue. But uh, for me, starting out and building the, the character and brand, um, it, it would be very deleterious to have to, or to not be able to, you know, show what represents the brand. Understandable, and as you said, the packaging is part of the marketing. Um, so if you can't show that, how is anybody gonna? How is anybody gonna choose one over the other? Well, yeah, yeah, it's not just the branding, but it's like you know the back of our pack is what I'm really proud of, and you know our our little blurb here. To, you know, if I couldn't say this, this is this is this is our mission statement: to grow tobacco right, you have to do it the hard way, the meaningful way, to have the knowledge to plant, prune, harvest, and cure tobacco remains an art form passed down through generations. Celebrating our American tobacco families and their art is the center of our operation. This is their ritual and tradition in your hand. And I'm really proud of those words. And I don't want the government to tell me that I can't tell that to my customers because that is what that is what makes me different. That is what makes, that is what makes Hestia different. And I will fight to make sure that my customers will know that this is the best possible iteration of an American cigarette that they could possibly purchase. Exactly. How is anybody going to know what they have in their hand if they can't see? Yeah. Um, I think the next one I have is uh, just uh, a general like tobacco industry question. Where do you think the industry is going to be in 10 years? Of course, for the last, uh, I want to say, 20, 30 years, uh, smoking has been on the decline, except for one year, a couple years ago, where it went up slightly. Um, but where do you think the tobacco industry as a whole, smoking metrics, etc., are going to be in 10 years? Uh, do you think a menthol ban will be in place? Do you think... There's going to be graphic warnings. I know you just said your uh, displeasure for them, but do you think any of that stuff is actually going to realistically come through? Or you know, what do you think it'll be to? I, I don't know. Um, I try not to give a lot of thought because you know the herd mentality is when you live in a country that uh, just about 100 years ago thought it was a bright idea to ban alcohol. So the delusions of masses is real. And things can happen that uh, are very just silly. So I try not to think about that. Um, I don't care that you know fewer people smoke some of my competitors' cigarettes. That doesn't bother me at all. Uh, I know that the folks that I know will enjoy Hestia and do enjoy Hestia will always be there because they're a specific small niche of folks who believe in the brand, the product, and what we're doing. And so you know. Um, Smoking rates, as as you say, could, could could fall precipitously. But I know that as long as I have the brand out there, we will keep growing because of what we're doing, because of how different we are. And I definitely do think that the the niche that you've worked out for yourself works very well, especially with the uh, with, with the fall of smoking rates, as I previously said. Because as well, you just said, uh, the target demographic are people who want a cigarette like Hestia. So the people who want the cigarette like Hestia tend to be people who genuinely enjoy tobacco, genuinely enjoy the brand and everything like that, and it's something that 
even if they might cut down, they're still going to continue enjoying what you want or something like that kind of thing. And so I think it's a really good niche you've learned about that is for sure. Thank you so much, Jacob. They're still, they're still going to head to the bar on Saturday night, and they're still going to grab a of Hasty as one of them. Exactly. And I think the final question I have to ask uh, is, uh, well, you previously said that uh, you don't think, uh, you, you don't want any competition or anything like that. So, of course, don't feel like you need to answer this question if you don't want to. Uh, but for somebody who wanted to start, who might want to start their own tobacco company, uh, any tips, any advice you would give? Sure, sure. So, you know, um, know what you want. You know, I, I started this company because I met some farmers that I really believed in and that I wanted to enable to do, to do their art and to create their art, and that enables me to create mine. Um, so f find your mission, find your mission statement. Is it, uh, whatever that may be, um, find it, find that pretty means within your life, you know? F find that pursuit and uh, just drive at it with all, you, with all your heart. I think, I think of that Bukowski quote, uh, what is it? Find what you love and let it kill you. So there you go. Uh, it, it'll take all of you, it's taken all of me. But I think it's worthwhile, and I believe in it. So just put in the effort. That's, that's all there is, man. Makes sense, understandable. And those are all of the questions I have for the interview. If there's anything else you want to say, um, that was fun. Say, of course, it was certainly fun. I'm certainly glad to have been able to chat with you today, and I'm certainly glad that uh, I was able to uh, always all watch the chat we just had and everything like that. Have a Hestia. Of course, of course. Well, thank you very much for watching this video, guys. So I hope you guys kind of enjoyed watching this video. If you guys kind of enjoyed watching this video, of course, please make sure to like and subscribe for more content. And of course, please make sure to check out uh, all of my social media and everything like that kind of thing. And until the next one, y'all, stay safe and peace. Have a great one. Thank you very much for watching. Stay safe and peace. Have a great one. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm sorry I had to specify my social media. Uh, just do. I can't say. Uh, I get it.